Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to see you all here and have everybody here with us. And those of you joining us online this morning, it's just a beautiful day today. We have the Lord to thank for that. And the victory that we have in His Son, our Savior, and the, the faith that we can put in Him, and the questionable life that we can lead to draw others to Him. Lord, we just lift ourselves up to you. We thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. You do more than we ever deserve, Lord, and, and we just can't thank you enough. But we offer ourselves to you as your stewards, Lord, to do to be your hands and feet here today until you come back for us. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. We read this morning from Luke's Gospel in chapter 7. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the house in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. And then verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited you, both of you, will come to you and say, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the seat of least importance. But when you are invited, to take the lowest place. For that when the... Go. Try that again. So that when your host... Comes, he will say to you, friend, move to a better place, and then you will be honored in the presence of the other guests, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. It's Luke 7, verse 1, and then 7 through 14. Treatments right now. 
for the next few days, uh, maybe every six hours or something like that. Um, so if you could lift Hadley up uh, in your prayers for healing and the Strumper family uh, to get through this. It's their first baby. Um, so they're a little anxious and apprehensive. And the irony there is he's a paramedic and he's still getting down. But it's your own kids. So uh, lift Hadley up in your prayers. You can also lift Emily up mom because they're also expecting you. Uh, so um, I also would like you to lift up our neighbor uh, Rochelle uh, who's struggling with some issues. Uh, just pray for her to have strength to get through this and overcome the problems that she's having right now in her life. Uh, does anybody else have any prayer requests or prayers or praise reports? Continue to keep Kay in, in prayer uh, with her loss and keep that, the whole family together in prayer that, you know, that they can come come to God and come to Jesus and, and get that strength and that, that uh, courage to get through this season in life. Um, and of course, this weekend being what it is, uh, we want to pray for our uh, military personnel, uh, pray for those families especially who have lost uh, loved ones who have volunteered to serve and given up their lives uh, for the freedoms that we get to have in this country, uh, including our freedom to gather here this morning. Uh, there's so many nations that don't allow the gathering and the free worship of God and of, of Jesus. Uh, they mandate what they want celebrated. And we don't have that in this country, and so we should pray to celebrate those men and women that have given their lives so sacrificially in their families as well. Um, that's not all right. Lord, 
and to be your, your missionaries in this world, Lord. That they can take your grace and love and mercy into that job, into that nastiness that is war, Lord, and bring hope and joy to others when they seem like they can't have it. Lord, we also lift up our, our own volunteers in our communities, Lord, our first responders, our police and fire, EMS, Lord, dispatchers that give up so much so that they can keep our community safe right here at home. Lord, we lift up our community of Warrensburg and Latham and this northwestern corner of Macon County, Lord, that people will come to you that people will see you through us and come to your table and ask for your mercy, for the redemption that they can receive through Jesus Christ, Lord. And we lift this all up to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome again today. Glad to have everybody here as we continue our series, Surprise the World, a tool to help us, I guess, become better stewards of God's Word to do the job that we were commissioned to do by Jesus. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for what Jesus did for us, for the sacrifice he made, and the lessons he taught us, Lord. We just ask that you open our hearts and minds to what his lessons had for us, so that we, too, can be faithful disciples and follow in his footsteps to do what he commanded us to do. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So, last week we started out with learning about questionable lives. Paul called us to live questionable lives, and he gave us a two-pronged method, if you will, for evangelism, for taking the word out about who Jesus is and getting it out. You know, one of those things was the gifted evangelist, uh, of which I admitted I am not, even though I am a pastor, I am not gifted with evangelism. Um, those are the people who can get out there and provide that really super in-depth, convicting teaching that makes somebody go, yes! And want to come up here, running up here, and kneel before the altar, and pray to God, and ask Him for forgiveness, and, 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 and for Jesus to be in His heart. And then you have us, the rest of us, the common people. The people who are supposed to live those questionable lives that come out and make people go, why are you the way you are? And asking those questions. Opening those doors to talk about Jesus. So today we come into step two of this process. And I ask you the question, all right, I make this statement. I want you to fill in the blank. The Son of Man came to save the world. To save the world. Good answer. Anybody else have an answer? How about this one out of Mark chapter 10? He came not to serve, but, or not to be served, but to serve. And then as you said so clearly, he came to seek and to save. But our lesson today is about the third one that he came doing. Found a little bit earlier in Luke chapter 7, it says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And when I look at that verse, or that portion of that verse, I go, Thank you, Lord! Because I don't miss too many meals. Uh, but yes, Jesus came eating and drinking. Now, that doesn't mean getting drunk. That just means drinking. At that time, most of the time, it was wine, and it was really more like grape juice, but he came in eating and drinking. The first two, his first two verses, they tell us what Jesus came to do. He came to serve, and he came to save. That third one, 
7, 34. The first part of verse 34 in chapter 7 of Luke's gospel is how he did it. It's all about how Jesus served and how he saved. And you really question whether or not he ate and drank. Doesn't take too much long. You can read Matthew's gospel. When he called Matthew, what did he do? He said, Matthew, come follow me. Matthew did, and then what did Jesus do? Jesus followed Matthew back to his house and had one heck of a dinner with all of Matthew's friends. He walked up to Zacchaeus towards the end of his ministry and said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down out of the street. You and I are going to go eat dinner at your place. He fed at least 9,000 people on two different occasions, a 4,000 group and a 5,000 group which were really actually probably three times that on both occasions when you count the women and children. He had at least three meals with the Pharisees, with three Pharisees. Even after his resurrection, he gathered them around the table. The two people he walked with to Emmaus, they finally realized who he was. Where were they? Breaking bread at the table. The end of John's Gospel. Peter and the guys went fishing because Peter just couldn't deal with his own guilt. They're out there fishing, not catching a whole lot. And Peter hollers out to him, Hey, you caught anything? Come on in for breakfast. And he had a fire and fish cooking for them. Jesus used the table to affect or to shape the neighborhood, to shape the lives that he came in contact with. So why shouldn't we? The table was an important part of Jesus' ministry. You know, some of the most surprising things take place at the table. I remember growing up, I mean, any number of things would happen. We, we laughed, we cried, we hollered at each other. But the most important thing was is we were together. We learned about what, it, what relationships are like. We learned how to act in this world if we wanted to foster relationships and open ourselves up to other people, to learn from other people. Jesus did the same thing. You look at these, the list of people he ate with. You know, the first two, Matthew and Zacchaeus, were tax collectors. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. And he dined with them around the table. The people he ate with brought accusations of gluttony and drunkenness, which we know Jesus was neither of those. He wasn't a glutton or a drunkard. But he inspired change in the lives of those people he ate with. Matthew and Zacchaeus were both hated by their fellow Jews because of their jobs. And after dining with Jesus, they both had a revelation. They both repented of their sins and followed Jesus. Matthew became a gospel writer. Zacchaeus gave back his what he had unlawfully taken from the Jews at, a, at four times the rate that he had to. His whole ministry began around the table. His first miracle at Cana, changing water into wine, was at a, 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 at a, a dinner, a, a wedding dinner. And if you think about it, in the context of what Jesus would, would later teach while dining with, with the Pharisee that we just read this morning. But also in this passage, in Luke chapter 11, it says, Now, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside Make the inside also. But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything 
will be clean for you. He opens up by chastising the Pharisees. Saying, you've got it all wrong. You're, you're washing your hands, but you're not washing what's inside. And he gives them that opportunity. He says, here's what you need to do to wash the inside. Will you do that? Are you willing to do that? Those jars that Jesus turned water into wine. You, you look at those jars and you look at what we just read, and what we read earlier this morning. You know what those jars were actually used for? Ceremonial cleansing. Those were jars that were kept at the entrance to the dining room for people to come in and wash their hands, maybe their bodies, their feet, if they accidentally came in contact with a Gentile or some other unclean individual, maybe a leper or somebody who's sick. Imagine what that water was like. Even, even if they had been empty, what was on the sides of that jar when they refilled them with water. When you look at these passages, you take them all together, and you look at them within the context of the entire New Testament, you can't help but see the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach you. He took something that symbolized the separation that the Jews had forced between them and the Gentiles. This uncleanliness. This you're not a chosen member of the church or of, of, the, of, of the, ch the children of God. You are not one of us. Therefore, I can't be with you. I can't touch you. I can't eat with you. I can't. And he made it a symbol of universal hospitality. The dirtiest jar in the house dispensed the best wine they had at the party. What he's saying is it doesn't matter where it comes from or what's going on. If God wants to use it, he's going to use it. That everybody should be included in the fellowship that we partake in. And he continued to use that table throughout his entire ministry. You see, the table itself breaks down barriers. When you're sitting there enjoying yourself and eating and drinking and being merry, you let your guard down and you talk. What more radical way is there than the dinner table that Jesus used? Do you remember? He was Jewish. He wasn't supposed to eat with the unclean. Yet, every recorded meal that he had has something to do with the unclean. Alan Hirsch and Lance Ford are a couple of pastors and authors here in the States, and they've rewritten the rules of mission. And they had this to say about the dinner table. Regularly sharing a meal is one of the most sacred practices that we can partake in, that the, in which the believer can engage. Missional hospitality provides us with an enormous opportunity to share the kingdom with others. And here's what I'm most thankful for and about. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. All diets are off. But it's not just about eating. It's about who you're sharing that table with. Just think of it. If each one of us in the church not just the two, four, six, eight of us here, nine of us here, 
but the entire church. Big C, global church. If each one of us invited one person every day to our table and fed them and dined with them and communed with them, the doors that would be open, the questionable life that you're living, the questions that will be asked as to why are you bringing that person into your house? Or why did you invite me into your house? It will be a surprise when we break bread with unexpected guests. What a questionable life that is. You see, the table is a forum for all sorts of conversation. If you're reading along uh, in the book that this series is based off, our author, Michael Frost, asks a question about an old, you see, witnessing an old couple in a restaurant that aren't talking to each other. We've all grown up through the pre-electronic age that are here sitting today. I think a better example for this would be, have you ever been out to a restaurant and watched a family at the table? Everybody's like this. I've seen couples, young couples. Yeah, you, she's got an engagement ring on her finger, and they're sitting there like this. Not a word being said between them. Now I can. I, I'm hoping that this little device for communicating with each other. I doubt it. But we have become so ingrained in those things, we have forgotten how to communicate with each other. Face to face. How to talk to each other. The dinner table is supposed to be a place for conversation, entertainment, rest and relaxation. I remember as a kid growing up, especially on, on Sunday mornings after church, we'd have brunch. Brunch would be served about 11 o'clock. Except during football season, maybe we would leave the table by 2 o'clock. Maybe. And to be honest with you, Deborah will attest to this, when we're at my mom and dad's, it's pretty much the same thing still. If mom serves a breakfast for everybody, we're there or three hours. Nibbling on the food, cleaning up the dishes, talking about life. You know, even our children, as they were growing up and they got their cell phones and their tablets, we struggled with that until we finally put our foot down and said, no more electronics at the table. They tried to get me to put my pager away from the firehouse that one was the only one that stayed on. But we put them away. We struggled. I'll be honest with you, we struggled to talk. We didn't know what to do, what to say. And then Tabitha came up with a great game. We had to answer or talk about three different things. We had to answer two questions. One was, what was the best part about your day today? We go around the table. Each one of us would talk about it. We bring it out. We discuss it. We laugh about it. We cry about it. Sometimes, sometimes we get angry with them about it. What was the worst part of your day? What was the other question? There was the crying and the anger. I got kind of got ahead of myself. But then we had to answer the girl. Then we had to make a statement, something that I want you to know that you don't know about me. As time went by, those, those statements got tougher and tougher because we were a pretty close-knit family. We had fun with it. But more important, it opened up that conversation. We solved problems. We cried over hurts. We celebrated victories. 
we learn about and from each other. You see, the table is where we learn to be family, to have relationships, to celebrate one another, regardless of what we may think of. And oftentimes I would ask that question of my sons in particular when they would say something that they want us to know or the worst part about their day because they got hurt or did something, shall we say, stupid. <laughs> and I, you know, we look at it, Ryan, when did you think that was a great idea to do that? Well, at the time I did it, but not so much after. But we would have conversation. You see, communion, communion together, having that meal will lead to conversion. It changes lives. It changes who we are. And so often, as Christians, we get hung up in the holy huddle. That gathering with people that are just like us, that also go to church and believe in God, and, and you know, even our 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 own, um, yeah, what do we call them? Uh, banquets, smorgasbords, um, potlucks. There's the word I'm looking for. You could have said it. You, know? <laughs> you knew I was looking for it. But anyway, when we have our potlucks. When was, when, when, when was the last time that you invited somebody from outside the church to one of our potlucks? You know, hanging out with those whom we feel comfortable is easy. That's what Jesus was talking about. Don't invite your friends and family and rich front neighbors. And, you know, that's the comfortable way to do things. Challenge yourself. Open your doors to the less fortunate. Provide for those in need. You see, Jesus calls us to do that. He calls us to do so much more than just be together. He calls us to, here I go again. And they do this, you know, love our neighbor. This is the way we want to be loved. Love, excuse me, love God and love our neighbor. In the book of Acts, which you guys will get to here in a little bit, Downstairs, those guys that are doing the, the Sunday school. What was one one of the biggest problems that they had that they had to solve was how do we feed the orphans and widows? We've got the Jewish orphans and widows, and we've got the Gentile orphans and widows. We can't do both. So the apostles said, "All right, well, let's get somebody, some of the Jews to do those, some of the Gentiles to do these, and we'll pray for them." Jesus came and he set the whole social structure for dining on its head. He flipped the table, so to speak. He ate with those that he wasn't supposed to. And he ate with them first and then sought their repentance afterwards. He brought them together to talk and to learn and to listen to what he had to teach. And then they could make a choice. He didn't go, come up to them and say, you need to do this or else. He opened up himself. He opened up through hospitality. Conversion came out of communion. He inspired change. Just by relaxing and dining with these people. The important moments, so much so that all of the gospel writers recorded at least one of them. Recorded so that you and I would have a plan to go through, a way to reach out to people. In essence, they were calling us to be radical socializers, just like Jesus was. Turn the world on its head and don't do what is expected of us.
The church working together, each one of us working together. It's kind of like this painting. This was done in 1410 by an artist named Andre Rublev. It's called the Trinity. It's a picture of God, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dining at a table together. And it's really exemplifies for us what we do or what we are called to do at the table. You see, when we gather with friends and family, we reflect on the image of God. The three of them together. Our reflection together with somebody else doing what they did here, where God opened up himself. You see, hospitality is the modus operandi of mission, of a missional life. The coming together and opening ourselves up to others, just as God did, opening himself up to the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, working for the same purpose together. We communicate through our work, through our dining, the love of God in the provision of life's most important need, most basic need, food and drink. And during that meal, it gives us the opportunity to discover each other, to learn from each other, but also to discover what each other needs. Inspiring questions that again will open those doors to present Jesus to somebody else. All important is the meal, is the table. It's pretty doggone important. Jesus used the table to introduce the new Passover, which we will celebrate here in a little bit. We call it communion. But he gathered his disciples around the table for the Last Supper and told them to eat and drink the bread and the wine, the bread being exemplified and exemplifying who he is. And not his body, but him as the word. Remember the John opens his gospel and it said, God became, the word became man. Jesus is the word of God. The bread, we consume that, we consume the word of God. And as we do that, we remember Jesus and what he taught. And the blood, excuse me, the wine is the blood that he shed. So that we could be washed clean. If we go back, tie this back to the back of the beginning of, the, of this lesson, when he said to clean the inside as well as the outside. What do we do with the, the wine or the grape juice? We drink it. Where does it go? <coughs> inside. <coughs> Communion is more than just a formal and liturgical event that we do at the church as part of it. Especially for the first century church. For those, those men and women, it was a celebration in the context of a banquet. The table becoming symbolic of Christ. The gathering together to help each other, to learn from each other to meet each other's needs. It's not the stage or the pulpit, not the music we sing or the bands that we listen to. It's the table that represents coming together. So, Continuing that theme of living questionable, we are called to live that questionable life. And what better way 
Oh, hang on, I'll get back to that. Last week was about blessing three people over the week. At least one of them not from our church. So how did that go for you? Were you able to be successful at that? Any stories about that? It's okay. It's not about what's seen. It's about what's done. This week, we're going to do what Jesus did. This week is an opportunity to bless three people in addition to the other three blessings this week. So now we have six. So bless three people, but also invite three people to your table. Should be something easy to do. For the most part, we all eat 21 meals a week. Three meals a day. If you really want to make it easy, invite all three of them to one meal. Which I think would be the best way to do that, because then you get yourself, a believer, a potential non-believer, and you can mix and converse, commune to bring conversion. That surprising fellowship that we have. It's time that we show the world what heaven will be like when Jesus comes back and we share at the wedding supper. In sharing meals together. Bringing God. Bringing that love and grace and mercy. To the people around us. Father God. You have brought us to the table. Through Jesus, we partake in that Passover meal, which we'll do here in a little bit. Lord, we just thank you for what he did for us. Giving us the bread to consume the word, the blood to wash us inside and out as wine. Lord, just strengthen us to be able to do that same thing. To invite the uninvitable to our tables and share a meal, to learn from somebody we may not learn from otherwise as we share a meal. Lord, we just lift ourselves up to you, we lift our tables up to you for that ability and that opportunity to be able to share with one another. We do that in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for bringing us together, for giving us this meal that celebrates the Passover from life, from death to life, so that we can be with you eternally, Lord. We just lift, it up, lift ourselves up to you, and we lift this up to you for your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his disciples together for the celebration of the Passover meal, the celebration of their freedom from the oppression of Egypt when they left there. And as we said this morning, it became a new celebration, a new Passover, a Passover into the freedom of life everlasting. And in that meal, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he told his disciples to eat and do this in remembrance of me, for this is my body which has been given up for you. When they had completed their meal, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, take and drink. For this is a cup of a new covenant, a covenant in my blood that has been, will be shed for you and for all mankind. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you for the blessing that you give upon us and the opportunity to have everlasting life and stand before you cleansed from within 
as we consume that bread and word and that wine and, and blood that cleanses us, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for that, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made. Lord, we thank you for the days that we have ahead. We just ask for your blessing upon our every movement and our every opportunity and door that is open to share who Jesus is with those around. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a great week this week. It's supposed to be pretty decent out. Enjoy the sunshine. And just have a blessed week.